Hi, my name is Martin Berkman. I'm a filmmaker, photographer, visual artist here in the Yukon. The theme of my work is primarily the land and our relationship with it. And uh, we're currently deciding the fate of the land in the Yukon, which is still significantly in a wild state. I've invited many people from many walks of life uh, to participate in a film I'm working on. I've been, had the pleasure of many visitors in my studio for interviews. One of them is Dr. David Suzuki, and uh, he offers a wonderful insight into a sense of the sacred and a sense of the sacred grounded in a rational understanding of our place in the big picture. The, the most common question I'm asked is, what is the most important issue we're facing? Everybody knows, I think, that Mother Earth is in trouble. The question is, is it global warming? Is it species extinction? Is it deforestation, ocean depletion? Which one? Which one is the most important? I say all of the above. Uh, nobody knows which one is going, going to do us in. But I believe that underlying, these are all symptoms, symptoms of something more fundamental to root causes that get us into this destructive way. And I think the challenge is the human mind and the values and the beliefs that we cling to. So I was a few years ago down in Peru uh, on a, I visited a village at the foot of a mountain, went there with Wade Davis. And I learned that the villagers are, from the time they're brought up, they're taught that that mountain is an apu. Apu means God. And as long as the mountain casts its shadow on the village, it will determine the fate of all the people in the village. So you can imagine how those people treat that mountain if they believe it's an Apu. And compare that, say, with a kid in Trail, British Columbia, who's taught all his life, well, there could be gold in those mountains. So I think the big challenge is that the way we treat the world is dependent on the way that we see the world. If we look on a river, as the sacred circulatory system of the land. You're going to treat it very differently from someone that sees power in irrigation. If you look at a forest as a sacred grove, you'll treat it differently from someone that sees timber and pulp. We are one species out of maybe 30 million species on Earth. And we think if we can save 12% of the land, which we're not doing, but if we think if we can put aside 12% of the land, then everything will be fine. Wait a minute now, we're one species out of 30 million species, and we think we're going to take over 88% of the land? Where the heck is all of that other biodiversity going to go? And I think for 99% of human existence, people understood they had a what, what we call a biocentric point of view, that we saw this unbelievably complex web of living things that were interconnected and interdependent. And humans were just one tiny strand of this interdependence. So when you look at the world that way, you realize, wow, when we're in a mesh of interconnected uh, existence, what I do has repercussions. It reverberates through the entire net, which means that whatever I do, there's a huge amount of responsibility that goes with that. And when you are able to use uh, some of the, the part of that web of living things, you're grateful. You give thanks for that. that. But when we live in, a, in an, what we call an anthropocentric world, where we think we're outside the web of living things and above it, that it's all there, God-given to use in any way we want, that's a very different way of looking at the world. So in a city, you don't see those connections, and it becomes easy to think, well, it's the economy, of course. So we've now removed ourselves from the real world, and the economy, which is a human-created thing, the economy has suddenly been placed in a position that people since the beginning of time knew was nature. When my grandchildren call me all the time begging me to take them fishing, do you think I could go where I went as a boy? Of course not. There are no fish. That's just, you know, it's a sad thing when your elders can remember a world that is fundamentally different, that is no longer available for our grandchildren. That's just not sustainable and it's not right. I believe every bit of nature we've got left is priceless beyond beyond any kind of value that we have. Why?
because it's the remnants of what was once this great productive net that we made a living from. And it's the only place we still have, have something to learn from. And to me, every bit of wilderness is that last library of information. If we don't have that there, we don't have four billion years of experience to learn from. And no amount of human science or technology is ever going to be able to duplicate that four billion year experience. And the incredible gift of nature is that I believe it can still be, remain intact and fully functional and allow us to enjoy it at the same time if we do it the right way. If we go with respect and we ensure that we don't put too much pressure, pressure on it. Nature's got the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, uh, the, the phosphorus cycle, the water cycle, all these things that nature is a part of, economists call an externality. And where I came to this was back in the Stein Valley that I talked about earlier. That I was uh, coming, I'd been camping up there with my family and then coming out of the valley, I ran into the CEO of Fletcher Challenge, the company that was going to log it. So we got into a discussion which very quickly escalated into a heated shouting match. And finally he got so frustrated with me, he said, listen Suzuki, are, are tree huggers like you willing to pay for those trees in the valley? Because if you're not willing to pay money for it, those trees don't have any value until someone cuts it down. And I went, oh my God, he's absolutely right. You see, those trees are taking carbon dioxide out of the air, putting oxygen back in it. Not a bad service. That's an externality in economics. Those tree roots are holding the soil so when it rains, the soil doesn't run into the rivers and spoil the spawning beds of the salmon. That's an externality. The trees pump hundreds of thousands of gallons of water out of the soil into the air and affect weather and climate. That's an externality. The forest is providing habitat to fungi and insects and bacteria. And that's an externality. So all those things that that forest is doing, as long as it's still there intact, to economists are completely irrelevant. Now, I cannot imagine a more destructive system than that. And yet that's what economists, that's what politicians and business people have said, that's the bottom line. That's what's got to be dealt with. That this generation of children spends the least amount of time outdoors of any generation in human history. In 150,000 years, Humans didn't spend their time cooped up in front of computers or text messaging and doing all that stuff. We were out in the real world. That's the challenge. So the challenge, I believe, is these areas are priceless beyond understanding. And we, as, like you are doing, have got to be warriors fighting to protect every bit of that that we can. But meanwhile, the challenge is in the cities. We've got to reconnect those children. Begin to realize, even though we live in this human-created place called cities, that it is the planet itself, Mother Earth, that's allowing us to live like this. And we have to, to have a sense of gratitude. So respect is the first thing that we have to learn. And uh, uh, we need in the cities a huge dose of humility. We think we're the cat's ass. We think we're the, where it's at. You know, we can, we can go to theater and go to all the fancy museums and shops and we're so s sophisticated and urbanized. Well, we've forgotten at the base we're still animals. And if we don't de deal with our animal needs, we're dead. If we don't deal with our social animal needs, if we don't deal with our spiritual needs, I don't care how wealthy we are, we're fundamentally hooped, I think. Well, I think that you, that's been wonderful. No, you, you're going to have a <laughs> shitty job editing that. <laughs> I, I,